Well, it's now time to bring in focus the interview segment for today. The first spot looking at Nigeria slipping into recession for the second time in five years as the gross domestic product contracted for the second consecutive quarter. The National Bureau of Statistics earlier announced this and then looking at a contraction of 3.62% in the third quarter of this year. This follows an earlier contraction level of 6.1% in the second quarter of the year. It is the nation's second recession since 2016, the worst economic decline in almost four decades. Now, the Nigerian economy has been battered by the coronavirus pandemic, which has caused a significant decline in all revenues as global economic activities also stalled for months. The average daily oil production level recorded in the third quarter stood at 1.67 million barrels per day. Now, the non-oil sector contracted by 2.51% in real terms during the reference quarter, which is about minus 4.36% points lower than the rate recorded in the third quarter of 2019, but 3.54% points higher than the second quarter of 2020. The non-oil sector was also driven mainly by information and communication with other drivers being agriculture, construction, financial and insurance sectors, as well as public administration. In real terms, the non-oil sector contributed 91.27% to the nation's GDP in the third quarter of the year, higher than its share in the third quarter of last year, which was pegged at 90.23%, and the second quarter of 2020, which was 91.07%. Well, joining me now live in our LEGO studio to give in-depth analysis of our topic for today. First is the founder of the Victor Strategy Insight and Advisory, Shago Mamara. Good to have you on the show today. Nice to be here. And for my second guest, I have with me Mukta Mohammed, the Chief Executive Officer of Finance Mukta. Mukta, let's start with you now. Did this figure come to you as a surprise? For so many economic watchers, it was largely expected, but this is a smaller contraction compared to the 6.10% we recorded in the second quarter of the year. But this is the worst recession Nigeria has ever dipped into. Well, if I say it's a surprise, I mean, I've not following the trend globally. Mm. Uh, it, you, you, like I said, um, UK went into recession, Canada was recession. South Africa was even in recession before the pandemic came in. So definitely we expected that and the GDP will contract for the second time and then will lead us into a recession. But like the financial minister said, if you look at those figures, you see that there's been slight improvement, in, especially in the third quarter. We have about 18 sectors contributing to the GDP compared to about six sectors the last time out. So, and again, um, other parts of the world are beginning to open up. So you, you see that play out also. So for me, um, not too bad um, a figure, but I mean, looking at it holistically, you say, oh, we are in recession, but looking at it quarter by quarter basis, you say, oh, there is improvement. Then not to forget that, definitely, why they say it's a worse recession. You can, normally, our recession is always, if you look at the 1980s, mm. it's always when the price of crude comes down, mm. then we go to serious recession. But this time around, we didn't just have the price of crude coming down, we had the pandemic also, leading to shutdown of virtually all the economy in the world, and Nigeria was not an exception. So we're just gradually coming out of it. That's what makes it the worst, the worst um, mm. um, um, type of recession we've seen for over, over, over four, 33 years. 33 years, just about a decade, mm. I mean, four decades. So for me, I think uh, the good news is that we will definitely be out of it. I'm sure fourth, fourth quarter will be, will be better than the third quarter mm. when it comes out. So for me, uh, we expected. But even the good news is that it's not as worse as we have thought it will be. Mm. Shago, at this point in time as well, looking at the fact that so many sectors of the economy were largely hit as an SME expert, a player within the space as well, you've had a whole lot of interface with other business minds as well. But looking at the recovery part in the Minister of Finance Budget and National Planning expects that by the first quarter of 2021, Nigeria will be out of recession. Based on the current macroeconomic indices we have on ground, the impact on SMEs, that's the engine of growth, no doubt, the COVID-19, the aftermath of the protests and much more. Do you think this is way too optimistic? Well, Nigerians have always been optimistic, and then this is not an exception. But I uh, want us to look at the, the reality on ground. is the fact that 50% uh, of our population, you know, income, personal disposable income, you know, has been, you know, eroding and then going down, and then that since 2019 till now. And then it's quite difficult for 
an average person in Nigeria to say that I want to go to market. And then don't forget, we are dealing with hyperinflation. I mean, it's been predicted that by the fourth quarter, it will get to about 15%. And then you have an inflation while the personal disposable income of people is actually going down. For me, that has a lot of impact on the SME because market is simply a, you know, a space where people can actually uh, you know, transact business. So their purchasing power, their ability to consume is being eroded. So meaning that for an average SME, there's that fear there. I mean, when I saw the figure, it was quite alarming. You know, an average household income in Nigeria, majority, which is about 50%, based on PwC and the mm. uh, uh, McKinsey report, 2017, says that uh, about uh, 120 million people in the household, you know, have an, a, a, an income below $1,100 per year. That is about 500,000 naira. So when you bring that down, you know, you have a half of your population, you know, living on just 40,000 naira a month. Or below. That's quite so a hard situation to have to manifest. That is a manifest very hard situation. Well, uh, Mukta, also looking at the fact that we've had cautions from the IMF as well as the World Bank as well, we're looking at the margin, which we are treading between now. Initially, we were looking at figures as well uh, coming from the World Bank, at pegging it at about 4.3%, uh, and then the IMF also saying we're looking at uh, no less than 3.2%, uh, but we are trading around 3.64% now. How do you think this also affects the market sentiments? Yes, the Nigerian Stock Exchange and the performance on the floor has been quite bullish, largely, irrespective of the impact of the COVID-19. But how do you think this new report would affect sentiments in still portraying the picture that Nigeria is still a good investment front for international and local investors? Well, uh, like I said, the, what we have in the market, we saw rallies or sometimes the kind of rally we saw in the market, kind of bullish ones in the market, was not due to any fundamentals issues. Mm -hmm. That's why we we're crying that people should buy fundamental goods stock at that time. It was just basically due to um, people having less investment vehicles. Um, the returns, people that were doing treasury, people that were into bonds, the returns were very poor. So we were looking for other speeds to go in and they felt the equity market was going to give them a better return. So what played out in the equity market was demand and supply. And so when, once the demand and supply came, the market had no other option but to, than to, to respond to it. And that was what we saw in the market. And if you, if you see, like I keep saying, the last time we had said those, those players are short-time players. So definitely we are seeing profit taking, bringing down the market. So it wasn't surprising. It wasn't anything has to do with uh, fundamentals, but the mm. fundamentals of the market is still there. But then most of the rally we saw have a lot to do with demand and supply. Now going forward, how will that be sustained? Like I said, short-term player. How will the market benefit from a recessed economy? It should have benefited. You, you know, uh, I know we say people, economic crisis is opportunity time. But now look, the, look like he said, the disposable income of Nigerians it's are largely eroded. Mm -hmm. And the other people that can help the market sustain it is the foreign investors. And we have the exchange rate volatility that have not been sustained because you can be telling me to bring in my phone at 380 something and I went in the other parallel market selling for about 480. So, so you see those challenges come to play. So definitely, uh, will that be sustained in the market? No, there must be a policy decision that could help the market. But for now, we are still the CBN to meet and all this. But I believe that in their meeting, what the CBN will be content with now, they will have to contend with inflation. They have to contend in trying to grow their economy. And for me, basically, I think they have not been able to address the volatility in the exchange rate. Because if you address the volatility in the exchange rate, it becomes a tool to in handling inflation. Well, we've consistently seen the CBN also try to inject liquidity into the market, especially just to stabilize the volatility we have seen in terms of foreign exchange. But that has been able well. to sustain? No, it has not been sustainable because mm. a lot of, or like I said, Nigeria depends a lot so much on, uh, on importation. I'll and come back to you based on the NPC meeting, but Shagun, now at this point in time, the non-oil sector, though it recorded a contraction of 2.51% in real terms, at the end of the day, we still see it as the largest pool in terms of our GDP contribution. But the body language of the government or the economic team at this point in time still has a very strong grasp 
on the oil sector in terms of not really letting go, and that almost seems like the only cash cow to be explored at this point in time. We've seen a whole lot of volatility in the market. And one of the biggest mistakes any economy can make is still relying on indices you cannot clearly maintain. But we saw improvement in agriculture, in the financial and insurance space, also looking at construction and other manufacturing subsectors. If we were to create uh, physical and monetary stimulus, irrespective of all of the interventions we've had so far. How much of an investment plan do you think we should have in terms of agriculture, information, technology, construction, manufacturing, these subsectors that have driven any sort of growth we've seen so far? Okay, I, I think we, we like to live in Dinaha in the sense that uh, the, the world has shifted away from the oil which is not sustainable again. And then the world is talking about impact investment. So if the world is talking about impact investment, it means that your sense of duty to your nation should be to look at where there are opportunities. Now, if you look at that report, the, the, the financial sector, the telecommunications, the fintech, I mean, the insurance, the agriculture. That is the future. But, you know, the, in the short time, it might look as if, you know, it, it's not contributing as much as, you know, the oil revenue. But the reality is that the percentage of growth and then the potential opportunity in the opportunities in those sectors are what we sustain Nigeria. Okay, I'll give you an example. Two companies, startup brought in, uh, were valued at uh, about $800 million, mm. right? I, I'm talking about companies that are just less than five years. So the, the simple thing is that as a government, except you have a policy direction that looks at Nigeria as an entrepreneurial economy, against the oil economy, you will still not put your efforts in the right direction. So the policy direction should be that Nigeria should take the part of an entrepreneurial economy mm. and allow the economy to be driven by private sector. Allow the economy to be driven by private sector engagement. That's one of the critical pillars for growth. But at this point in time, uh, Mukhtar, I'm sure you're aware with, of all of the borrowing plans as well, looking at the fact that the 2021 budget and all of the assumption is largely based on deficits that have to be funded by borrowing. Do you think we can expand the threshold of lendings to the real sector of the economy at this point in time? You look, um, government is borrowing. And sometimes when you look at the rate that government is borrowing outside, they're trying to look at other rate outside. It's even better than what you see SMEs or companies borrowing inside Nigeria. And so that means government is borrowing even a little bit cheaper than what you have companies that are At about zero, zero interest rate. Interest rate. So what, like he said, what the government should be doing is to see how small business, even the big business can borrow at cheaper rate. But unfortunately, uh, we, are not, we, are not, we are not doing that. Government is the largest... Borua government seems to be one of the largest drivers of our economy. If government is not having activities, there's, the economy comes to a standstill. So all our lives move around government. Ordinary in a good economy, in a developmental economy, government brings out the policies, then make the environment conducive, provide security, provide good infrastructure. You get your value of tax from those infrastructure, then business runs and business pay good tax. So the challenge we have here in Nigeria is that Number one, we have infrastructural gap. Number two, now we are not even governed with insecurity, which is a major challenge in any economy. Once you start having insecurity, then they, they, that becomes a major, major challenge for any investor, anybody who wants to come into your country, begin to look at insecurity, they begin to turn their back off of this country. So for now, borrowing as it is, like I keep saying, it's not bad. But in Nigerian context, where everybody is shouting, don't borrow, don't borrow, don't borrow, look, you borrow based on your revenue. Revenue to GDP is not, is not fantastic. But taking cues from the World Bank and the IMF at this point in time with the meeting of the Central Bank of Nigeria's uh, Monetary Policy Committee as well, do you think we'll see a shift in terms of the decision that will be, rate, that'll be uh, reached in terms of looking at liquidity ratio, cash to reserve requirement, asymmetric corridor and other indices, do you think? I, I think if 
in a in a normal situation, when your when your when your economy goes to recession, you cut rate, you bring the rate down. Normal situation. But we are in Nigeria is in a abnormal situation because if you cut rate, you bring the rate down, you bring in more liquidity, you have, you have to fight in inflation. And not to forget that exchange rate volatility is there. So what the government should be, for me, I just keep saying what CBN should have addressed, what should be CBN major concern now is how to control, how to bring down that volatility in the exchange rate. How to try to attract foreign direct investment, try to even attract portfolio investment so that those rates will come down. Once you do that, you indirectly be tackling inflation. Uh, 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 inflation. And once you do that, the economy will come to tell an equilibrium, a little bit of equilibrium there. You, from there, you begin to, your policy begins to meet the people. But as it is now, the ordinary man in the street is not feeling anything from the government because exchange rate is the driving factor in price stability in Nigeria. Most of the things that we use in Nigeria, about 80 to 90 percent of these things are imported. imported. So once the exchange rate is high and some of these importers, now government has said, source for your phone yourself. So they, it doesn't matter how you're going to source for your phone. Some of them source it at 460, some at 470. So you can't expect someone to sell at, uh, source for 470 and then sell it at a lower rate. So definitely that's the challenge. I think if I'm in, in there in CBN now, I would just be thinking, how do we address this exchange rate volatility? They try to address it through infringement, trying to stop betting companies. I don't think that is working. They should think out of the box and see how we can address this. Uh, Shagun, beyond the economic advisory team and other uh, committees we have on ground, what sort of engagement do you also expect now to be brought to the fore to aggressively deal with the recessionary pressures that we are dealing with at this point in time? Talking about those in key sectors of the economy, have a round table and let us deliberate on how to move the economy forward. Because one of the biggest challenges as well is looking at tax collection measures, looking at revenue generation capacity and surpassing all of the targets. But the lacking element there is the conversation of strategic investment with players across key different sectors that would drive growth. I, I think the, the challenge has always been there in the sense that you want to formulate policy and then you come from top down rather than from the bottom up. So for me, usually I say the hypothesis of, you know, triple here, which is ethics, uh, efficiency, and engagement. You see, formulating policy, you know, for recovery should actually, you know, have key players in those sectors, and then for government to allow them to participate in the policy development and any direction. Before coming there, uh, so someone who exports products, you know, ag produce from Nigeria to the US, you know, spoke to me and said, I learned you'll be going on TVC. He said, I, I live in the US and I bring in agricultural produce. But the frustration I have is at the port in Nigeria that over there in the US, that he doesn't need to leave his house to clear his goods at the port. But for those goods to leave Nigeria, to US, you have to deal with multiple agencies. It takes time. Sometimes it takes days and months to take goods out. And then we are looking for inflow of Forex. So for me, the, the, the government seems not to be in touch with the reality, with the key players in those sectors. And that is where it should start, not from the top, should be able to engage them and then allow them right, to contribute towards the policy development and the direction. I think when we take a cue or we learn from them, we will be able to solve real issues and not the surface issues. Mm. What forecasts do you have at this point in time, Mukta, looking at our recovery partner? Now, going back to the initial uh, forecast and uh, blueprints that were being created, central banks across the globe are meeting just to ensure that a U-shaped recovery is met at the end of the day, understanding the intensity of the times at this point. But what do you, do you say, the for, would you say the forecast still remains bleak, irrespective of the reopening of the economy? What do you see? V shaped, no. U shaped, a sharp decline and then a sharp recovery? Is that I, what I think we'll see? Uh, we we'll see a decline definitely in the fourth We're already in the decline. We're already in the decline. So we'll see a gradual improvement in the economy. But like I always say, Nigerians don't do anything to come out of recession. 
<laughs> we don't do anything. <laughs> we just wait. Once but we can't price, rely on the oil prices well, that's, recovery. That's, that's why the minister can tell you that in first quarter or second quarter of next year, he believed that we'll be out of recession. We rely on oil price. We've, we've talked that in, we, we talk the oil price at $39 per barrel. Oil is selling for about $45. Mm -hmm. We are already hurry. That's what we're looking at. We, from, the, from, from the forecast, we learned that oil could get to about $48 by, sec, by first quarter or second quarter of next year. But there's barely half the $70, $72 that was trading earlier. So we cannot jubilate on any recovery because when, any when volatility is When it was trading for $70, $72, down. what was our, our benchmark? What was that? What, where would you it, peg it at? Mm -hmm. It was about 50 Now, if it goes, we are now at 39, 39 and it goes to 45 the way our economic teams... The way our economic policymakers react to events is based on the price of crude. Once we come out of, we've been in recession. This is the second. Remember the time we went into recession, oil price was about twenty dollars per barrel. Mm -hmm. Immediately it jumped out to thirty-five, forty, fifty. We were out of recession. We did not do anything. So we are going to still continue those recession. Unfortunately, you can't keep doing things the same way and expect anything different. So definitely, when price of crude goes up, Nigeria will be out of recession. But the challenge is. Ordinary is not a problem. Use what you have for that decision. Begin to diversify your economy into other sectors. But we only say diversify. Now that the economy is in recession, you will hear government jingles on <laughs> diversification. Once the economy is out of recession, go back <laughs> to normal. Well, thank you very much for your contribution so far today. Mokhtar Mohammed. it's been a pleasure speaking with you. And hopefully government takes a couple of cues here and there from all of the measures you've also Ex, uh, explained and then it's even time to look at infrastructure development exploring we the capital bank, market yeah. we have as the, well we have and then, bank. <laughs> thank you very much Shego Mamura as well and hopefully we see the engines of growth looking at the MSME space also grow irrespective of current challenges because there's no economy in the world that thrives without the MSME space exactly thank you very much gentlemen for your time on the show yeah. thank you